Hello everyone, my name is Ian and you're watching Big Rock Moto. Thank you so much for tuning in today. And if you're new here and you like this kind of content, I hope you will consider subscribing. Now, if you follow my channel for any length of time, you know I'm a pretty avid, enthusiastic dual sport rider. And over the past 15 or 20 years that I've been doing this, I've owned all sorts of dual sport bikes. I've had Suzuki DRZ 400s, I've had Yamaha WR250R, I've had a bunch of KTMs, I've had 500s, I've had the 525 EXC, I've had a bunch of different dual sport bikes over the years. Now, since I have other bikes for long distance adventure riding, like my KTM 890 Adventure, my Aprilia Twig 660, and others that come and go, I decided last summer or last fall to purchase a new dual sport bike, something that is for single track and hardcore off-roading. Now, for myself, I only purchase factory street legal bikes. I live here in California in USA, and we just don't have many legal off-road riding areas unless you have a license plate. So I only purchase, I only buy factory dual sport bikes that are street legal. So last fall, after selling my 2017 Beta 500 RRS, which I have a separate review on, which I'll link here, I was looking for a new dual sport bike, and instead of buying new, I got very lucky and found this fully set up, very low mileage, absolutely beautiful, 2022 KTM 350 EXCF. I got it for a great deal, and I've been riding it for the past nine months. In fact, this bike was such a good deal and had so much stuff on it, I actually have an invoice somewhere in my paperwork, which I can't find right now. I have an invoice for this bike, for all the stuff he did to it at the shop uh, that he bought it from, including the price of the bike, for over 18,000 US dollars. Now you might be saying, that just seems ridiculous. Why would anybody pay that much for a dual sport bike? Well, the truth is, there are people who have the means to do something like that. They want the absolute best they can get, and they're not looking as much at the, at the price tag. Now for me, I bought this bike used, I think I paid around $12,000 for it, which was an absolute bargain in my opinion. So today we'll take a look. I'll show you the, the specs features, kind of some of the changes I've done to the 350. Uh, talk about, you know, why it costs so much money. We'll talk about why I chose a 350 instead of a 500. Then we'll go out for a ride. We'll really test this thing out on some trails, some single tracks, some fire road. Then we'll come back here. We'll discuss any pros and cons to the bike. Um, and then we'll wrap up with some final thoughts. So with that, let's get riding. All right, let's talk a little bit about why did I choose a 350 instead of a 500. It seems kind of obvious to get the 500 because it's got more power, more torque. It costs about the same as a 350, and it's the same motorcycle, the chassis, suspension, everything's essentially the same. So why would you pay the same money and not get more power? Well, I've always had 500s and 525s, whether it's the Betas or the KTMs, I've always had that. I've always wanted to try the 350. A lot of people said the 350s handle better in tight trails and single track because the motor has less inertia and it makes the bike steer and handle better. They have a bit different power delivery. These things rev higher and uh, they don't quite have the low end torque of the 500, but they rev out more and they still have really good top end power. So basically I just wanted to try it. And because I have other bikes for fire roads and adventure rides, I didn't really need the extra power of the 500. And uh, so far I've been super happy with the 350 and we'll talk more about it during the ride. So in terms of how this bike is set up, a lot of changes to this bike. So this is, the thing is when you get these 350s and 500s, when you get the dual sport version, the EXCF version, at least here in the USA, they're really choked up and plugged up by all the sound and emission requirements. So in order to get this thing to be street legal, they really have to tune it kind of in a weird way. So the bike, when it's in stock form, uh, doesn't make a lot of power, doesn't have very good fueling, It'll stall out and flame out. You hear people say the flame out, which is a, an absolutely true thing on these. And so this bike has had all that addressed. So I have the Athena uh, Get ECU uh, with a map switch here. That's a very expensive modification, uh, somewhere around $1,000 plus just to do that. That changes the fuel mapping of the bike and allows somebody to write a custom tune to change the fuel mapping. And then it gives you a power switch on the bike for a lower or higher throttle response, which you can set up how you want. And also in terms of power, it has the reeds removed. It has an FMF um, exhaust system, which is just this part to here. The header pipe is still stock. Now all that together adds a ton of power and a ton of torque and a ton of uh, drivability uh, to this bike. No more stalling, no more flame outs, no more rough fueling. And it has a ton, a ton of power. Seriously, you'll see here in a second. So other changes we've got, I've got golden tires, which getting kind of worn out, they're due to be replaced soon. I've got the fatty front, which I like, the little bit wider, fatter front to absorb bumps. Um, the suspension, 
the suspension is all redone. So uh, Three Brothers Suspension in Orange County, California did the suspension on this bike for a 200 pound rider who rides pretty aggressively off-road. Now the previous owner had that done, but thankfully I am also a 200 pound rider who rides a pretty aggressively off-road. So it was perfect because he spent all the money and I got the benefit. So different springs, different valving, different oil. The factory suspension on these bikes, while it's better than most dual sports, for discerning professional riders is still not very good. It's still soft, a bit mushy, and you need to have it redone. With the suspension done like this, this bike is phenomenal. It's a magic carpet, and it makes me feel like a much better rider than I am, and it gives me control of the bike, so that's a great thing. That was expensive. So you start adding all these things up. The power tuners, the exhaust, the suspension's redone. Um, I've got a Scott's steering stabilizer down in here. You can see it stabilizes the steering. I've got flex bars. I've got metal handguards, integrated turn signals. I've got a Baja Design Squadron light. I've got radiator protection from uh, Rocky Mountain, from Tusk. I've got a P3 carbon guard on the pipe. I've got a TM Design Works skid plate, different brake levers. I've got some bling on here. I am changing the foot pegs, they're just not here yet. Um, I've got, I, I, I know I'm forgetting more stuff. Uh, protection for the sides of the engine and the swing arm. This bike is totally pimped out, totally tricked out, spare no expense. So this bike did cost around that $18,000 mark for the original owner. And to him it was worth it because he wanted the best and he could afford it. I got a good deal used even though it only had like 250 miles on it. When I bought it and I've even added more stuff to it. Now is it worth the price? To me it is because... I'm fortunate that I can, you know, allocate this this much investment to a dual sport bike. And when I go for my dual sport rides, I want to be riding the best bike possible. That's just the way it is. I've had tons of bikes. You know, this has been a hobby of mine since I was a kid. And life is short. I just want to be riding the best. This is the best that I've been able to come up with if, if you don't have a budget. If you're on a budget, well, this is not going to be obviously a setup for you. If you can afford it, this thing is absolutely phenomenal in every single way. Now, a high performance dual sport bike like this, um, I often say these are not really good for beginners. They're also not good for anybody under about six foot, which is very unfortunate. The reason is these have an extremely tall seat height. In order for them to get the 12 to 13 inches of suspension travel, which makes the bike amazing off-road, they have to get the seat way up there. So this is a 38 inch or 960 millimeter seat height. I'm five foot 10 inches tall, about 1.78 meters, 32 inch inseam, and even I struggle with the height of this bike. So even just getting on it, the seat is so far up, it's like halfway up my stomach here. Um, I have to really swing my leg up and over, get on, and then when, it, when I swing over from the kickstand, you can see I'm on my tip toes. Now the suspension, because it has a lot of travel, it does have quite a bit of sag in it, uh, but let me put up the kickstand and show you. So even for me, I'm on my tiptoes. Now, I usually just put one foot or one toe down when I stop. I don't put both feet down, um, but still, it's a very tall bike. Now it's light, not very heavy, you know, 250 pounds uh, in stock form, so that's good. Getting off the bike is also a little bit awkward. I really gotta be flexible and swing my leg up over it in order to do that. Now, a quick gear check as we get started on this ride. People always ask me about my riding gear, so I'm not trying to be an advertisement, but just people ask, so I should tell you. And I do spend a lot of time testing gear, so I kind of figured out what stuff works good and stuff that doesn't work good. And if you don't see me using something, it's because I don't like it. So, uh, for this ride, and I'll link all this below, please use my links to help support the channel. I'm wearing CD Crossfire 3 SRS boots. I'm wearing uh, Moscomoto Kiger mesh pants, which are a great new uh, mesh flow-through pant from uh, Moscomoto. I'm wearing uh, uh, Revit knee guards, uh, scrambler knee guards. I'm wearing a Revit, uh, what is it called, Proteus armored shirt, which is great, has tons of armor. CE level two, it's really awesome. Then I'm wearing a Moscomoto workhorse jersey over that. Uh, I'm wearing a Moscomoto Wildcat uh, 12 liter backpack in a stargazer color, which I think is really cool. I've got my Cryos Pro helmet, which I like for dual sport and dirt riding. It's just so lightweight, it flows out really well and it works good for filming. Uh, let's see, what else? I've got MSR ADV Air gloves. I think that's about it. And I've got these cool um, sun these sunglasses that have a foam. If you can see here on the camera, they have a foam um, uh, gasket around them. So instead of goggles, I use these. Goggles don't work for me. They pinch my nose and I don't, just don't like them. So these seal the dust out of my eyes. When I'm riding off road, I just flip up the face shield and I've got good protection there uh, from the dust. So I, I really appreciate that. Okay, let's get on with the ride.
So I'm just riding along. I didn't know it was like this here. This is a road that's supposed to go through. But this is kind of a good example of why dual sport bikes or lighter weight motorcycles are great because you know, I may have to like go around like through the field and go through this ditch and stuff. And if you're on a big GS or something, it's going to be like really difficult to do that. But with this bike, it's a mountain goat. You know, with the lightweight bike, you can do anything you want. There really are no limitations based on the bike. The limitations is, is you as the rider. And I fully admit that. Like, I'm not a professional level off-road rider. So I'm, I'm holding this bike back. The bike's never going to hold me back. So I guess while I'm here, it's kind of a good time to talk about some of the specs a little bit and just talk about a couple of other things I have on here. Um, so recluse clutch, I didn't mention that. Yeah, that, I mean, I'm warming up to it. I'm getting used to it. It has some major advantages and a couple disadvantages. The advantages are it doesn't stall. You can't stall it because it's like an auto clutch. Um, technical riding, uphills, rocks, ruts, steep, loose hills. Uh, it's amazing. Descending going downhill stuff like that. I'm not so sure because the clutch will freewheel and you have to blip the throttle to get the clutch to Re-engage to give you engine braking. So it's kind of weird in that regard Also some kind of trail maneuvers or like popping the front wheel up or you can still use the clutch But it's a little awkward. It just takes some getting used to um, I'm not sure that I would put it on the previous owner did that I'm not sure that I would do that if it was my own money uh, looking at the upgrade um, the bike weighs in stock form, under 250 pounds. I think around 245 pounds. I'll put the kilograms here. Um, so that's pretty awesome. I mean, that's why you get this, because it's, you know, 50 pounds lighter than a Honda 450, or, you know, 70 or 80 pounds lighter than a DRZ 400. And it feels that. It feels that. Trust me, I've had DRZs. This feels like a feather compared to a DRZ. Um, what else do you want to know? Let's see. Uh, horsepower is probably, <laughs> I mean, you can debate that. There's not really good information on the horsepower. It's probably around 30 to 35 in stock form horsepower. But this bike, with all the upgrades, is probably more like um, 45, 50, maybe even more than that. It, it's a huge improvement over the stock bike. So there's that. Um, what else should I talk about? I've talked about some of all the other stuff that I've that I've got here. Um, and the aftermarket stuff does make a difference. Like the seat concept seat, this is the Comfort XL seat that makes a huge difference to the comfort. I've got the Reckless 10 Moscow Moto bags. I carry my tool roll, tube, tire tools, um, first aid kit, stuff like that that I like to be when I'm out here by myself on the trail. It's got the bike's got a tail tidy. It literally has just about everything. The one thing it doesn't have is a bigger fuel tank. So the stock fuel tank is two gallons. I don't know what that is in liters. I'll put that here. But it gets you around 100 miles or so of range, um, which is kind of limiting. You're always getting gas. I was going to put on a bigger tank, but they're kind of expensive. And the truth is I have one of those giant loop uh, gas bag, armadillo bag things that I can just put back here with a gallon if I need it and then use it up and pack it away when I don't need the fuel. So I might just stay with the stock tank. Um, yeah, so it's a pretty awesomely set up motorcycle and I'm super privileged to be able to have it. So with the recluse clutch, how this works is when you start opening the throttle, the clutch progressively engages. You can see in first gear. What you don't want to do is forget, think that you're a neutral and give the throttle a huge blip because the bike's going to wheelie over on you. So you got to remember that you're, you know, you're in gear. So like getting through crap like this, I mean, I should take a running start at it, but like this bike is so, so light and so maneuverable that really it, it doesn't matter. It almost doesn't matter what situations you run into. It's not like an adventure bike where it's going to hold you back, you know. I mean, in all these huge ruts and washouts, the suspension is so phenomenal that it just, it does what you want to do and it just, it just works. <laughs> so you can see how the bike really likes to rev out. Um, it likes revs, you know, but it still has a ton of low end torque. I'm in third or fourth gear And you see how I grab the throttle it's got a ton of power even for a 350 even when I'm in pulling too tall of a gear 
and it just the combination of the tractable engine and the recluse clutch i think is part of it it almost feels like the bike has like built-in traction control it's really quite amazing let me try to show you what i mean about the recluse so it's probably my riding style is not very good but like sometimes when i'm going downhill it'll just start to freewheel and i'll lose my i'll lose my engine braking like let me see if it does it here probably not a steep enough hill um, but sometimes it does that, and that's the weird thing about the Recluse. I just this bike is so phenomenal and so much so much fun it's just it's sensational um, the bike is so light and it has so much power that anytime you want the front wheel to kind of carry over some obstacles you could just add power and it lifts up the front wheel and it's so light it just makes the chassis and suspension work that much better so for fire roads um, it's amazing of course it's fine you know um, do you need a bike like this to ride this kind of road? Of course not. Um, but it doesn't mean it's not good at it. So a couple things I forgot. Uh, I've also got heated grips. I put the Tusk grip heaters on. They really warm. I've also got some, um, what are these grips? Uh, Pro Pro Taper, Pro Grip, I don't know. But I just like the blue accents on everything. Um, I'm also using this Tusk handlebar bag, which again, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to make this video be an advertisement. But this is great because it, it a tank bag's in my way on this bike, and I don't like the straps of the tank bag. So this keeps everything out of my way, but I can put, like in here, I've got my uh, goggle cleaner stuff for my helmet cleaner. I've got my wallet. Uh, I've got some Kleenex for when I'm crying in tears on the trail. I've got GoPro batteries, multi-tool. I've got my inReach, which I know I should put in my pocket. I've got uh, eye drops, chapstick, uh, hydration tablets, tire gauge, like just the kind of stuff you want quick access to. Um, you could also put your cell phone in here if you want. I've got my cell phone in this pocket, but again, just really like that. Uh, Moscow Moto also has a new bag kind of similar to this I'll be testing out. Anyway, um, down there, so that's Hemet down there. So I live in the mountains way back up that way. Uh, this is the north fork of the San Jacinto River, and it's just raging right now because we've had so much rain, so much snow this year. It's just really raging. I know this is not a geography video, but I love this kind of stuff. So yeah, that's Hemet down there. That's like a Highway 74. And then uh, we're going to go up in those mountains over there, hopefully, on this ride. So should be fun. So I'm really enjoying the, uh, riding this bike on this fire road. It's great. Um, sitting versus standing, you can play around with that. Weight, weight distribution. Try to get your weight, you know, to the outside of the turn. Get those knobs to grip on the edge of your tire. A lot of good practice. Uh, having a great day. All right, uh, let's get on the highway with the 350 and talk a little bit about that. So, the reason that you ride a 350 or 500 on the highway is because you have to. I think that's really the main point. This bike is designed to connect trails on the highway, which is amazing because you don't need a truck and it opens up the whole world to riding. Um, but 55 miles an hour feels like I'm going like 100 on my 890 or on an adventure bike. I mean, I'm not joking. Like, the level of wind and vibration and just kind of instability. Um, I mean, I'm probably exaggerating a little bit, but you know what I mean. Like, 60, with the gearing that I have on this bike, 
about 60 miles an hour is really my max cruising speed on the highway okay um i've got 1350 or no sorry 1450 gearing on this bike i tried 1452 that was a little bit too short a little bit too revved out but cruising at 55 is no problem now vibration yes they do have vibration both the 350 and 500 um some people will swear that they don't but that's don't believe them these bikes do buzz through the bars through the foot pegs through the seat it's not designed for travel <coughs> it's designed for you know enduro off-road riding aggressively so they, there's not a lot of thought given to comfort and vibration reduction stuff like that now that being said it's totally tolerable um and you know i've got flex bars i've got the brp uh, rubber mount so my bike's actually not too bad they're worse in stock form it's also going to depend on the tires you have and things like that uh yeah so they're not these, these are not highway mile munching machines and nobody ever claimed that they were um i know there are people setting up 500s for <coughs> longer distance travel with more road but i think that's fine and if and if you're happy with that then, then more power to you for me uh, if i'm going to do much road then i either want a 690 or just the 890 frankly um but this bike is designed to connect trails you know it's designed to be legal to go on the highway to connect between different trails so 20 30 miles at a time yeah that's okay 100 miles 200 miles no going on the freeway no not in my opinion plus you're just gonna tear up your tires and if you're running a bib moose which i don't run bib moose for this reason but if you run a bib moose then you're just gonna burn up and you know the bib moose is gonna catch on fire from overheating so i just run super heavy duty tubes i just find that to be better for how i use my dual sport bike um double take mirrors are nice to have because you can fold them out they give a pretty good view on the highway i've got the smaller dirt bike ones i don't use the adventure mirrors on here just because they're a little bigger and heavier um yeah that's that's kind of it and i've got heated grips if it gets cold so that's nice uh the biggest things that make a difference is the seat uh get the seat concept seat if you have one of these bikes or even if you have a honda 450 or drz or any dual sport just get a seat concepts and get the wider one the wider seat does make the bike feel a little taller but in my opinion it just makes the so much more comfortable like it the seat is not hurting my ass to the point of agony like the, the stock seat if you sit down for more than about five minutes you're in agony and i'm not even exaggerating about that all right what about <laughs> oh. <laughs> You probably didn't see the front wheel was in the air for part of that so what about like gravel roads stuff like this higher speeds i mean yeah because of the way this bike is tuned it's got tons of power the stock 350 is a little bit slower um you know a lot of people will buy 500s for this kind of thing i mean this road i could ride on any any adventure bike out there even with street tires but is it more fun on a dual sport yeah because i can slam into ruts and rocks and I'm riding such a lightweight bike, it's so much fun. <laughs> Even at higher speeds, like if you want to light up the tire, if you want to light up the tire at 35, 40 miles an hour, and kind of drift around a corner, this bike still has more than enough power to do that kind of thing. Right, let's talk a little bit about maintenance now one common concern or complaint i see out there a lot is oh ktms you know those things are such high maintenance bikes well that statement doesn't really make any sense and really isn't true at least not in today's uh, day and age um, ktm just like all motorcycle companies they have different maintenance requirements depending on what kind of motor what kind of bike it is so if you look at their street bikes or adventure bikes the maintenance on those is just the same as you would get on pretty much any adventure bike or street bike from any manufacturer. If you look at their racing dirt bikes, which this happens to be, even though it's got a license plate, yes, the maintenance requirements are more, uh, if you look in the manual, it's going to say oil changes very often, valve checks very often, things like that. But that's for racing use. Now, am I using it for racing use? I'm putting around on fire roads, maybe a few single tracks. Uh, no, the answer is no. So do I have to change oil every 10 hours or 15 hours? Do I have to check the valves every 20 hours or 40 hours or whatever it says? Or rebuild the engine every 50 or 100 hours? 
absolutely not. And you don't have to believe me. There's tons of people out there. You can do your own research, and you've, they've proven this. If you look at the Honda 450L, um, bikes, a bike like that has really the same kind of maintenance requirements if you go by the manual as this bike does. So I'd rather have the less weight and get this. Um, <clears throat> so the whole thing about KTMs being high maintenance is really bogus and just something people say on the internet um, that just it just has no basis in reality. Um, if you if you use it as a race bike, um, then yes, you should maintain it as you would a race bike. Um, now, in terms of doing the maintenance, yeah, the oil change is pretty easy. It's got two oil screens, uh, which are so it's got a great filtration system because you got the two oil screens that are down here. You just pop off your skid plate, oil screens, oil filters here. Pop that out, nice big oil filter. Um, that's really easy to do. Air filters right under here, valve check. I mean, yeah, check the valves every 100 hours or something. Have your shop do that, or you can do it yourself. I've done it on these bikes. It's not that hard to do. Um, it's not a touring bike, folks. It's not designed to put five, ten thousand 10,000 miles on in a year. If you're going to put that kind of mileage on, this is not the mo kind of motorcycle that you should be riding, frankly. So uh, what else in terms of maintenance? Um, it holds a liter of oil. So yeah. Um, I change the oil every, you know, 20 to 30 hours, depending on how I've been riding it, if it's real dusty, if it's real hot. You know, a liter of oil doesn't cost that much, and an oil filter doesn't cost that much. So it's like, if it's got 20 or 30 hours on it, I might as well just change it. Um, but you can stretch it way out beyond that if you want to. All right, so I want to show you guys the bike's single track capabilities, but there's a couple of issues I'm running into with that. One is that I chose the most difficult trail in my entire area and I'm by myself, which is really not that smart. And you can see it's really tore up. I mean, look up here, this is this is the trail. Like loose rocks, huge tree roots, big rock step ups like this, um, big rock waterfall shelves. This is really not the kind of terrain I prefer to ride on my own without a buddy. So I'm not gonna go any further up here. I mean, you could see the trail up there, how that is. Um, so I know, you know, there's already people, keyboard warriors typing, oh my God, you know, I did a trail like that when I came out of my mother's womb on a tricycle, or I could do that in a Subaru or a GS. All right, come out here and prove it, make a video, send me the video when you're done. Um, but for me, I could ride this kind of stuff. I've done it a lot, but just not by myself. Um, and this is, this is definitely, not terrain that would really be physically possible to take an adventure bike in. So let me get this bike flipped around now. There's a couple ways you can turn around a bike like this. You can kind of pivot on a side stand. You can pop the throttle if you're really skilled and kind of whip it around. But I'm not Chris Birch. But but the point is, um, if you have to turn around, it's you know, it's doable because it's not too big and heavy. So we'll ride out on this trail, kind of show you. I mean, this is what it's designed for. Um, again, I'm not Chris Birch, I'm out here by myself, so I'm gonna be careful. But to the tight, narrow trails, rocks, climbs, river crossings, this is the terrain of, you know, what this kind of thing's designed for. And the recluse clutch is really nice, I'll kind of show you. So the recluse clutch allows me to to really carefully modulate the throttle and you can't stall and you don't have to use your fingers to slip the clutch. A lot of loose boulders, loose rocks in here. But this is no problem for this bike. This is what it's made for. And then if I start to, if I get stuck, like let's say I get stuck here, oh my God, this is too tough, whatever. I could just plow, I should have just plowed through in second gear standing up. But if you do get stuck, the recluse is nice because you can just carefully 
see how I'm not touching the clutch? You could just carefully feed in the throttle and the bike gives you a very gentle uh, clutch slip automatically. Some whoops here. Yeah! Whew. Oh, the suspension is so good on this thing. And now we're back to the main road. So, I mean, I'm sorry I can't really show you the potential of this bike, but the performance level of it off-road is above, I would say, 98% of people who are going to buy one, and I think that kind of about sums it up. All right, I found a beautiful little spot with a little creek, a little shade, so let's talk about the competition. Now, you guys are smart. I know you guys, my viewers, you guys are super smart and astute about these things. So. Um, DRZ, yeah, uh, is the DRZ good enough? The DRZ is probably good enough for most people. Let's be honest. It is uh, 50, like 70 or 80 pounds heavier than this. It has less maintenance requirements. It's got a you know a bigger oil capacity, so you can go longer between oil changes and valve checks. Um, the suspension is okay on the DRZ, just okay. Um, but the weight, the suspension, the chassis, the handling, the power. I mean, this is a whole nother universe to that. And I'm not being disrespectful to DRZ owners. I've had like three DRZs. They're amazing for the money. If you're on a budget, just get a DRZ and you'll be happy. And they have 80 or 90% of the ability of this bike. Is it as fun to ride as this? No. Um, would, I, <laughs> would I buy another DRZ? No, because this is available and I'm able to have this. So there's no way. Um, okay, Husky. So you notice one thing here. You notice how on KTM, they call this PDS. I think progressive damping system or pivotless damping system, something. But the point is the shock attaches up here to the frame and then down here to the swing arm right here. Now, what do you not notice? There's no linkage hanging down below the bike. It doesn't use a traditional suspension linkage. The advantage of that is that, well, the shock is up uh, out of the way from obstacles, rocks and things hitting underneath here. Um, and it provides, in my opinion, in my experience, I really like the ride quality that these have. So, and there's less moving parts, there's less maintenance because you don't have the bushings and stuff to grease or service inside of a suspension linkage. So I'm a big fan of this design and that's why I'm always going to buy the KTM over the equivalent Husky. Now, compared to the Husky, so FE501, FE350S, uh, those bikes, they're the motors are the same, the chassis are largely the same, the Huskies have a, maybe a, like a composite rear subframe, they have the shock linkage instead of the PDS system we just talked about, they use a different brake um, master cylinder, and they're white, that's, that's about it. So there, there, there's not a huge difference between them. If you can get a good deal on a Husky, just get the Husky. If you can get a better deal than on, than the KTM. For me, I, I like the KTMs. I also happen to like the color orange personally. And I, I like the PDS system as opposed to linkage. But there's not much difference between the Husky. You know, they try to say, oh, the Husky is the premium version. It's not the premium version. There's hardly any difference between an FE350 and this bike. If you rode them blindfolded back to back, I don't think you could tell a damn bit of difference. Um, other dual sports... This is the best dual sport bike. If you just want my honest opinion, and you know I try to be unbiased and give all these reviews, but th this is the best dual sport bike. Um, sure, get the 500 if you do more desert, more open riding, if you don't do as much single track, but it's the same bike otherwise. Uh, this is it. I mean, put a few things on it, get a more comfortable seat, maybe do the suspension, um, do the power. It's worth it. Just get the power mod, the the ECU thing, Takamoto sets all that stuff up for you. Just do it. If you're an avid dual sport rider, th there's nothing as good as this. Uh, the betas, the betas are the next closest thing. I've had a beta. It was a phenomenal bike. I still prefer this. There's more parts for this. This is a bit more modernized, I feel. Um, there, it, it's just, you're going to see more KTMs on the trail. I just, I don't know. And I like the suspension of this. So, I don't know. I prefer this. The beta is amazing. There's really not too much difference. It's kind of splitting hairs. Like, they're su both super high performance. I'd love to have another beta. The new ones look beautiful. But for my money, I'm just going to go with the KTM, honestly. I, I just, there's just more parts available for it and more people ride them. And that, that, that does count for something.
<laughs> See, just the ability to just pop that front wheel, just lift it over whatever you want to lift the front wheel over. It's just, gosh, so nice. One thing that I've been really trying to pay attention to in my riding uh, off-road, and I know this is not a tutorial video, but I've been watching a lot of the Chris Birch training uh, that you can buy on his website. No affiliation, but he, um, you know, he says you got to get your, you got to get your body really far forward. You got to get, you know, kind of get your junk up on the tank um, to get your your mass kind of over the the, the uh, swing arm pivot. Because the problem is, mo the, the mistake most dual sport and adventure riders make is they sit back here on the bike. But the problem with that is there's no weight, there's no pressure in the front tire. So those, the knobs on your front tire can't bite into the terrain. And that's why people always lose their front end and wash out. Whenever you hear somebody say, oh, my tires are no good. I washed out my front end on my adventure bike. It's not because of the tires. It's because their posture was wrong. You need to be sitting way the hell up here. It almost feels weird at first. Get your elbows up. Um, get your elbows up because that gives you a stronger position uh, when when impacts come through the bars and allows you to use your arm muscles and not just your shoulders but you'll notice a huge difference when you start doing doing just these two things try to get your elbows up a little bit and shift your weight forward on the bike even when you're sitting down you got to be sitting way far forward get weight into that front tire Well, that was an absolutely awesome ride. I hope you guys enjoyed going on that ride with me as much as I enjoyed doing it and filming this. So are there any downsides to the 350 EXC and uh, would I buy it again? And what are my final thoughts? So downsides, honestly, there's really only one overarching downside that I can really think of. And that downside has to do with price, not just the price of purchasing the bike, which is already Eleven or twelve thousand dollars before taxes and fees, just to buy the base bike. But then the cost of setting it up. If you wanted to run right, you've got to do the ECU, you've got to do the pipe, you've got to do all the stuff. Then there's the cost of aftermarket suspension. If you want that, all the other stuff you see, it's crazy. It gets crazy. But if you're an avid, an enthusiast, a serious rider who has the ability to get this, then there's nothing out there that's really as good as this uh, for all-around dual sport riding. Would I buy this bike again? Yes, I think if this bike was stolen or totaled, I'd probably just go out and get another 350 EXC. Now, KTM has a redesign for 2024. The changes look really awesome. However, in reality, am I really gonna get on that bike and notice the changes? Probably not, because I'm not a professional level rider. I think if most of us were honest about that, we probably, we probably wouldn't notice the changes as much. Um, they incrementally improved the bike. This was redone in 2020, and it was incrementally better than the bikes that came before it, like 2017 through 2019. Uh, was it a total revolution? No. So I don't expect that with the 24. So I think now is probably a good time to get a good deal on a slightly used or maybe a brand new uh, 21, 22, 23, 350 or 500 EXC or the Husky 350 and 501. And I've talked about how those bikes are essentially the same with a few differences, mostly with the suspension. So if you've seen some of my other videos, I'm kind of gotten famous for switching bikes a lot. What people don't always understand is that part of my job is to review different bikes and I do long-term ownership series. So of course I buy and sell bikes for that purpose. However, this motorcycle is different. This is my personal bike that is so perfectly dialed in and set up. It's got so much invested in it that I really can't imagine selling it. The only way I would sell this is if I was getting another bike just like this, maybe a new one, and then moving all my parts over. That's about the only way I could consider parting with this. But other than that, it has a permanent place in my garage. It's phenomenal, it's sensational. And if you can afford one, I think you should go out and get one. So thank you so much for watching. Hope this was useful. Please support Big Rock Moto. There's ways to do that in the description below and in the pinned comment. And uh, check out the gear that I'm using for this video as well. Thank you again so much. Please ride safe and I'll see you out there.